Easter is in, uh, what, six weeks? Yeah. We're going to do, um, we're going to lean into the week before Easter. The week before the resurrection. You know, Jesus wasn't calling it Easter yet. The week before the resurrection is called the Passion Week. Jesus makes an entry into Jerusalem. He clears out the temple. He, uh, he's anointed. He there's just some, has a last supper with the disciples. He, he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is tried, beat, brutalized, and then he is ultimately crucified. And then he raises again on what we celebrate as Easter Sunday morning. That's a pretty full week. That's a pretty active week. And so leading up to Easter this year, we're going to lean into that. And we're going to uh, to start out with what we call the triumphal entry, him him making his entrance into Jerusalem. And so uh, I'm excited about this. We're going to read, um, we're going to read that story, Matthew chapter 21. And I think I'm going to pull some things out of here you might not have thought about before, hopefully. If you have thought about them before, watch Netflix or something. But I'm going to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge the church this morning in how we think. So why don't we stand to our feet in honor of the word? We're going to read from Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Say amen if you're ready. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. God, in times like we're living, we pray that you challenge us to be like Christ. Lord, help us lean into him today and learn and have the same mindset, the same spirit as Christ in the way we treat others. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Hey, before I get into this, I do want to let you know I talked with Mark Mason of Life on the Verge. Some of you uh, know him and Susan uh, travel. They call themselves musicianaries. They travel all over the country uh, ministering in prisons and in really, really dark, rough prisons. And I talked to him yesterday. He said, Chris, pray for us. We are going to a prison in Mississippi that was labeled as one of the worst prisons in the country. Anybody remember where art, a brother where art thou? Anybody remember that movie? I can't believe you'd watch something like that. Um, anyway, that was a good movie with a lot of great music. And um, <laughs> there you go. We're all the same. Um, anyway, this is the prison where some of that was shot at. And it was historically known as one of the worst prisons in the country. I don't remember the guy's name, but there's a, a, a prison warden who has gone into other prisons in Louisiana that were deemed worst prisons in the country, and he has revitalized them by introducing in faith-based programs into the prison. And so this same uh, warden, I believe, is now in this Mississippi prison, and he is inviting life on the verge in. 
and Mark said it is a dark, violent place that the light of the gospel is beginning to go into. And so they are, they are there this week, multiple days, doing multiple events uh, for prisoners there in Mississippi. So if you could just remember to pray for him and Susan and the whole team. Uh, they have a whole professional band that is traveling with them. And if you're friends with them on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you're at, if you wouldn't mind just sending a, a shout out to them, knowing that we're supporting them in a church, as a church, could you do that? The gospel does go into the darkest places on the planet. Matthew records Jesus entering into Jerusalem for the last, the last week of his life. It's a bit surreal because it feels like a parade when you read it. I don't know if any of you are parade fanatics. I think COVID uh, killed a lot of parades that used to happen. I remember... Um, I just thought about this the other day. I remember I pulled a parade float for 20 years. It's on my resume. <laughs> I can drive a truck with a trailer behind it very well at two miles an hour. <laughs> it feels like a little bit of a parade when you, when you get to this part where there's people laying their, laying their garments down on the ground and palm branches and and, and there's people in front of him and behind him. It's like a procession. It's like, it's like a big deal. He's entering it. They're, they're making a big deal about him entering into Jerusalem. And they're saying, Hosanna in the highest. Which translated means, please save us. Or, or, or in some translations, it's a little more emphatic than that. A, a demand to save us. Now we have to remember that the context of this of this Hosanna in the highest son of David, this was not in the terms of save us from our sin. They believe Jesus is riding in, finally, we're gonna get some freedom here. Jesus actually, if you go back in Matthew, you can find out uh, he's ma he has been making his way to Jerusalem. He starts out in Jericho, he meets Zacchaeus. Do, do some of you know about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Remember that? Anybody went to Sunday school? Um, I like the repetitive nature of that song, saying "wee little" a lot. Zacchaeus comes to saving knowledge of Jesus. Jesus is walking through. Jericho, and there's a big stink about it then. And Z you know the story of Zacchaeus, he climbs up in a tree, um, which is dangerous for kids now. But since he was a small man, it was legal. Uh, he <laughs> climbs up in a tree to get a good view, and then Jesus looks up, picks him out of the whole crowd. Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? Why don't you come down? We'll go to your house. Could you imagine? Do you imagine the excitement in Zacchaeus in that moment? Out of all the people around him, packing it around him, he looks up, makes eye contact with Zacchaeus. How many of you, how many of you, you were in the tree and Jesus looked up, making eye contact with you, like hide behind the tree, like, I don't want him to see me, I just want to. But he ends up going to Zacchaeus' house and there's a life transforming experience. Zacchaeus walks out and says, man, I'll repay, he was a tax collector, I'll repay everybody that I took money from. I mean, it's, it, it is transforming what happens to him. Then he comes out of Jericho, and there's a, I think Matthew records two men. Other gospels record one, but let's say there was two, and one of them was named Bartimaeus, and it's, he's blind. And they're almost heckling Jesus, like, you have to heal us. Jesus stops, and it's recorded that he heals what we now call blind Bartimaeus. He's, he's walking towards Jerusalem. Now he's, now he's on the backside of the Mount of Olives. He's going to go over the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and he's going to end up in Jerusalem. Now, between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem, it was, a, it was a Sabbath day's walk. You could only walk, I think it was 2,000 cubits back then, which was um, not, not a real far. You were, you were restricted on the Sabbath about how far you could walk. So the way the Mount of Olives is described is as a Sabbath day's walk. 
So Jesus is, you picture him walking, walking across the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley, and he's getting ready to enter into Jerusalem. He pulls the disciples aside. You can imagine, people are in front of him, people are behind him. There's a crowd moving from Jericho on. At some point in time, he pulls the disciples aside, and he says, hey, don't forget why we're going here. The parade is neat. The parade is cool. Mark records this, Mark chapter 10, verse 32. It says, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. So you get this whole sense of the crowd like, whoa, something's happening. This is a good movement to be a part of. He's healing people on the way. This is unbelievable. It's exciting. This guy's something. Now you can imagine being part of the crowd, being all worked up about it. Wouldn't that be neat? Jesus pulls the disciples aside. And taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. Saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him and after three days he will rise. Now, I need you to put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Do do any of you have those friends that are just like the reality checkers all the time? Like you're having a good time and they're like, this ain't gonna last. And you're like, dude, why can't you just enjoy now? What's what's wrong? Everybody's excited. Everybody's excited. You're like, you know, you're having a party at your house. Everybody's excited. You got that one person running around going, who's leaving the lights on? Somebody's got to pay the bill. Everybody's looking around like, are you listening? This is kind of what it feels like. Kind of feels like everybody's caught up in the moment. And Jesus has to pull them aside and say, hey, I know this feels good. I know this feels like a big parade. I know it feels like we got a whole lot of support. And all these people are walking with us and they're amazed. And this is a great day. But I need to remind you why we're going to Jerusalem. Because this parade can make you forget it. I need to remind you why we're going to Jerusalem. We're heading up to Jerusalem, and what's going to happen is I'm going to get arrested, handed over to the chief priests and teachers of the law, and they're going to accuse me and try me and beat me, and they're going to crucify me. And then I'm going to rise again. It's a reality check, isn't it? There's times where it feels like the church is having a parade and we don't know why we're having it. Times where it feels like the church is exciting. And, and, and we may be excited for the wrong reasons. And, and so if we could, I'd like to have a little sidebar conversation with you this morning. It seems like Jesus pulled the 12 over to the side and all the excitement and chaos and we're going to church and said, hey guys, don't forget, this is why we're doing this. This is why we are going. If you get caught up in any other reason, it's not gonna be good. This is why we're going. So the first thing I'd like to say is this. This is not a political parade. Now I know it's 2023 and everything is political. This wasn't a political parade, although people were trying to make it into a political parade. He's going to come and save us from the Romans. He's going to come and make all this stuff right. We're going to have freedom now. We're going to be able to do what, we're going to be able to be, do our faith. Romans aren't going to have anything to say about this. Is, but this was not a political parade. We have a huge issue today in the church where, where in in our, in our country, especially where everything is political. And you've heard me talk about this. Everything is political. And here is why this is so dangerous. 
because politicians take polls to figure out what is right. Hmm. Can I, can I ask you a question? When, when you had little kids and they were like three, five, and seven, how many mornings did you wake up and go, okay, it's school time, but we're going to take a vote? <laughs> because I want to get elected again as mommy. More than ever before, politicians take polls to figure out what the right thing to do is, not for the sake of the people, but for the sake of reelection. Come on, can we just agree on that? I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, or some other kind of crap. Um, I don't care. But that's the way it works, amen? That is the way it works. That's the reality of the world we live in. We take polls to see what is right. The issue is the church knows what is right because truth is not subjective. Truth does not change when culture changes. Truth does not ebb back and forth depending, depending on how much money is flowing through the economy. Truth does not all of a sudden take on a different look because now more people approve of this one thing than they did 50 years ago. It's truth and it comes from the word of God. And when we start taking polls about what's true, the church always loses. The world loses when we start taking polls about what is true. The problem with our society now, the problem with culture now, is we have based truth on whatever the majority of people believe it is. And the truth is, the truth doesn't change. That's where we get the idea of what's called absolute truth. So you hear people say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. There is no such thing. There's no such thing. If forgiveness is good for me, it's good for you. Amen? If repentance is good for me, If love is good for me, it's good for you. If, if, if being meek is good for me, it's good for you. Now, some of you are looking up like, when has that ever happened? The Bible is absolute truth. And, and here's the scary part. Can I, can, I just, can I just fill you in on that? How many, of you, how many of you grew up thinking one thing only to turn into an adult later and realize it wasn't true? And some of that was shocking, right? There were some things you found out as an adult that you went, oh, oh. Now, I need, I need to let you know something. I don't think she's in here, is she? My niece, is she in here? I don't, I don't think she is. I had an hour conversation last night with my niece about uh, unicorns. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so... I believe in the horse unicorns. I believe in those. They look real to me. I've seen them on movies. Looked like a, it was a horse with a horn. She had it on her shirt. But she had this other thing that she claimed was a unicorn. But it wasn't. It was more like a ring-tailed monkey with a horn on its head. And so I had a conversation for about an hour about like, hey, that's, that's not a unicorn. And she said, it's a baby unicorn. I said, it's not. It's not. I don't care how... But she's smart, like crazy smart. And I said, I can't wait to go to school with the, fir the first day of school with you. And can I go with you? She said, yes, and you will learn that this is a unicorn. <laughs> I swear to you, I'm not, her parents are sitting right back there. I'm not making an ounce of this up. She's going to become adult one day and realize I was right. <laughs> that wasn't a unicorn. You put a horn on a monkey, that's not a unicorn. A unicorn is a horse with a horn. Okay. My biggest fear is that I'll stand before God one day and I plan in a flag on something that wasn't true. Because I held my finger up to try to figure out which way the wind was blowing and about who around me thought it was popular and about 
and about whether the country thought it was popular, my, my favorite politician thought it was popular. And then one day I stand before God and he goes, Chris, that wasn't true. I gave you what was true and you chose to avoid it to be popular. You, you chose to avoid it to get votes. You chose to avoid it to get approval. If the church turns this into a political parade, the truth gets diluted. Jesus had to pull the disciples away and say, hey, listen, this isn't about waving palm branches. This is about me going to die and defeating death, hell, and the grave. And on the third day, I'm going to resurrect. And the Holy Spirit is going to be is going to triumph over all of this through me. And I need to let you know that we need to stay laser focused here because there's all kinds of people that are going to try to push us this way and push us this way. He's telling it to Lazarus. Remember what's true. It's not about, it's not about taking polls. It's not about taking votes. It's not about being popular. When the church starts running down the road of being popular, we lose who we are. Now, I like a full church. I'm not saying we shouldn't invite people. I'm not saying we shouldn't have smoke and electric guitars. I'm not saying all that. What I'm saying is when it comes down to the truth, when we bend it to get more people, mm, that's a dangerous thing for the church to do. And here's what I've found. I've been doing this long enough to know. They're all The cracks start showing up. Because there's never been a good church built on subjective truth. You could build a temporary church on subjective truth, but the church is built on the absolute truth. Amen? It's not a political thing. Paul wrote to the Romans, he said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual, which is your spiritual worship. Verse two, is it up there? Read it with me. Do not be conformed to this world. Listen to me. You can stop there. The next time you ask yourself what is right, and we don't refer to God's word, the second question you should ask yourself is that I in danger of conforming to the world. Am I in danger of conforming to the world? And this is the thing, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do we do that? The word of God. The ingesting the word of God. Over and over and over. How do we renew our minds with the truth? We just take it in and take it in and take it in and take it in. There's not enough self-help books to renew your mind. There's not enough, there's not enough crystals. There's not enough, there's not enough anything to renew your mind. It's the word of God that does it. And Paul's telling the church, listen, you cannot be conformed. You cannot do polls. You can't. You can't just be wishy-washy. Every time somebody disagrees with what the truth is, we can't then bend to the disagreement. Amen? And this is the result. Then you will be confident about what the right thing is. If there's anything the church should be is confident about what truth is. It says, then you'll be able to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable. Then you'll be able to discern that. You know how we figure out what the truth is? By looking into the word of God, applying it to our lives, and finding out that it is true. Amen? That it is true. God measures by obedience, not by popularity. Did you hear that? Now, I don't want the church to shrink. I don't want less people to show up. I want more people to accept the truth. But at the end of the day, God judges us by obedience. 
Have we been obedient? Can we be, be obedient when there is cheering? And can we be obedient when there's none? Because I'm going to tell you something. I like a good parade. That's why I say all the time, amen? Because I like being agreed with. Anybody else? I think you're smarter when you agree with me. I think everybody is. And you think the same thing. So can I be obedient when everybody's in agreement? And can I be obedient when no one agrees? That's the tough part. So it's not a political parade. Here's the other thing I need to make sure you understand. This is really important in our culture today. It was also not a military parade. Matthew, in his gospel, writes that there was two. There was a donkey and a colt. Uh, other gospel writers don't mention the mom, just mention the colt. And to be clear, Jesus rode on the colt, a colt, not the colt, the colt. To be clear, and this is why. He's fulfilling prophecy from Zechariah. They would ride in on a colt, a young donkey, a young donkey that hadn't been ridden before. Now, I don't know if there's any horse people around here or donkey people around here. But I don't think the little ones are really tame yet. True? Like, you don't just walk in on a horse that hadn't been, whatever you call it, broken or trained or whatever, and just hop on it for a parade. Which one do you want to ride in the parade, Jesus? Give me the one that ain't broke yet. It'll at least make it a little exciting. He does it to fulfill prophecy, but there's another side note to this, that leaders, leaders and rulers would ride in on cults as a sign of peace when they rode into a place. I'm coming in peace. So the Prince of Peace, we know Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace is giving peace to a cult because there's no indication that that thing acted up. He sat on it for the first time. I see a business plan in, in the future. Jesus can break horses and donkeys like just by sitting on them. Hey, we're going to bring them all over here, just let Jesus sit on them and they'll be calm. He gets on the colt, the colt doesn't act up, and so Jesus, the Prince of Peace, gives peace to the colt he's riding in, and he is proclaiming peace to the country. He's saying, I am peace, and I'm coming to you. Now, not the peace that they were expecting, this militaristic peace, because now we believe we get peace through strength. Man, it just doesn't fit together all the time, does it? I want to be a peaceful Christian, but I believe in peace through strength. If that's the case, Jesus should have rode in on the white horse to show everybody, don't mess with me. Lightning bolts will come out of my eyes and kill everybody. I am God. But the church can't miss because we live in the age of, of grace, and I'm going to make a distinction about this, we're not to revelation yet. Mm, some of you can't wait. Some of you can't wait. Lord, get on the white horse now. Kill them all. But we're not there yet. We're still in the cult phase. Are you following me? We're still on the Our Savior wrote a cult into Jerusalem. It wasn't a military parade. It wasn't Jesus coming in all of his might and all of his glory. It wasn't that. It wasn't Jesus coming in going, hey, nobody would get better get in my way. He had just pulled the disciples aside and said, they're going to kill me. And I'm going to ride in a cult proclaiming peace. Huh. 
I think the church is in a difficult place right now. When I say church, I mean church as a whole, where we scream more than we pray. I'm going to say that again. What the world has done, the way the, well, the way the culture is going, the church has been duped into screaming more than we pray. We're riding into town. We're riding into town halls. We're riding into political events. We're riding in on white horses saying we are powerful enough to make you bend. The church stopped showing up on a cult. The church forgot that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. The church forgot that the way to respond to a dying culture is not on a white horse, is not with a parade of our strength, is to follow Jesus right to the cross, to serve right to the last minute, to serve until it until it takes our lives, we serve and we serve and we love and we forgive and we let them, dare I say it. We've been taught in our modern Christianity that we need to defend the gospel with a white horse. And when the Bible talks about, when the apostles talk about defending the word of God, it's not that. It's not a militaristic defense. It's not, it's not bring out the cannons. We're going to kill all the unbelievers. History should have taught us this by now. It didn't work. But the white horse makes us feel powerful. The white horse makes us feel legitimate. When the church can rise up and boycott, it makes us feel like we have a purpose. Because for some reason, when the church gets together and bows our knees in prayer, it just doesn't feel that effective anymore. But Jesus is pulling the disciples again, saying, hey, listen, we're not riding here on a white horse. That'll come in the future. We're not riding on a white horse. I'm riding in on a colt right now. And they'll arrest me praying, not screaming. Matter of fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't Jesus say, who did you come out here to get? You sent a whole army out here. Who did you come out here to get? I've been out here praying. I'm not not the one making a stink. I'm just out here praying. Oh, would it be that the world, when they come after the church, they find us on our knees, not fighting, not with swords, but with God's word in front of us going, God, we just want to serve like you served. If it takes our lives, it do what it does, Lord. But we want to be in obedience to you. The white horse will come one day, but God gets to decide that. In between there, we're called to serve. think we believe in the white horse more than we believe in resurrection. We believe in this present victory more than we believe that he can raise our mortal bodies. Jesus had it totally different and he was trying to convince the disciples walking in, hey listen, this is not about us walking in with a big stick making everybody obey us. This is about us serving to the end. This battle is going all the way to the end of being obedient in service. Forgiving people. There should be something about the church that brings peace when we arrive, not conflict. Now, where do I get the white horse from? Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven 
arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the wine presses of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's an absolutely amazing picture of Jesus' second coming to rule and reign over the whole earth and bring justice. But I need to let you know, church, that he decides that. And as of yet, he's not gotten the white horse out of the stall. The colt is still the one the church is riding on. The colt is still the one. Peace. Every time after his resurrection, Jesus would enter into the room. And what he would, what would he say? It's wartime, boys. No, he would walk in and say, peace with, be with you. When the church walks into circumstances, we have the truth on our side, but we ride in on a colt. And we walk into emergency rooms, and we walk into conflict, and we walk in to places that nobody else wants to go. And we don't start fights. We bring peace with us. So sometimes we got to turn the news off. we got to turn that social media off. If you can't bring peace into Facebook, get off. Let, let, Easter's coming up. You're going to have a family that'll get together? Ride a colt into Easter family dinner. That'll be your first test. Ride a colt. You don't have to be right. He's done that for us. We can ride a colt in every circumstance into our school systems into our the places we work what if they just label us as the most peaceful people they've ever met maybe they would listen to the gospel a little bit but don't fret church the king of kings and lord of lords will come on a white horse one day and he will vindicate everything that has ever happened but not today so we got to get the arrows right we got to know when we're living and the time we're living in. Amen? Come on, the band's going to come up. i got to wrap this thing up. The last thing is it's a triumphal parade. If you're walking through difficulties right now, listen to me. On the way to the cross is not the time to bow your head. We were destined for it. If you think that's a defeatist statement, you got me all wrong. Because I, I believe in the Mel Gibson style of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Everybody watch the passion, beat him down, and there was that moment where he went, Rrr. I was like, boy, that's a Jesus I can get behind. Going to the cross with his head up. Nobody forced him. He went because it was why he came. So the difficulty we're walking through as believers isn't somebody forcing us into it, isn't God manipulating us, isn't all that stuff. I signed up for it because I knew at the beginning, when I follow Christ, I follow him right into the sacrifice. I follow him right into the difficulty. I follow him right into the suffering. He didn't mince words with me. He said, if they persecuted me, get ready. The same thing is going to happen. You're going to have trouble in this world. He was as honest with me as anybody's ever been. The problem is the church sugar-coated it, and we said, oh, if you join Jesus, your life will be perfect. And so we, we walk into difficulty, we put our head down like we did something wrong. Lord, I don't know what's happening to me. No, Jesus walked in with people waving palm branches. He's walking to a sacrifice and people going, yeah! Because he knew he was going to rise again on the third day. And here's what I know about you. In the middle of your circumstance, whatever you're walking through, he still has the power to resurrect that circumstance. And even if it doesn't get resurrected in this earth, he has the absolute power to guarantee you eternal life. Why do we suffer with our heads down? 
Why do we suffer like something's wrong with the church? We talked about this three weeks ago, James chapter one, verse two. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The closer I get to the cross, the more I'm like Jesus. The closer I am to suffering, the more I'm like him. Jesus didn't pull the disciples over to say, hey, listen, I'm going to get... I'm going to get arrested and beat and killed and rise again on the third day. So when we walk in this thing, man, you act sad. You act defeated. You act upset. You act like you don't want to do it. No, no, no. He said, let them cheer because victory is coming. Let them cheer because over, they're going to watch me overcome death, hell, and the grave. Let them cheer because they're going to see the Holy Spirit empower you, and you're going to transform a whole world. Let them cheer. This is a victory dance into suffering. Stand to your feet. I don't know what you're walking through this morning, but I need you to pick your head up because there is no help down around your feet. I need you to pick your head up and say, Lord, if I'm going to walk through this suffering, you're going to be with me every second of every day. Your purpose is perfect in my life. And when pain enters in, I am, I can, I am like Jesus. I am like him the most when I'm walking through a difficult time with my head up, trusting the Father, being empowered to minister even in the middle of that. So that's what we ask you for this morning, Lord. Lord, we pray that you'd focus us on the truth and make this about you. And Lord, we'd be a church that embraces truth on a cult with our heads up. Let us bring peace into every circumstance we walk into this week, Lord. For the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, church, can you give him a big amen this morning?